2023, wow. Who would have thought, right? Some of us that have uh, grown up as longtime Christians, our hope would have been in 2023 we'd be on the new earth. At least I know that's been my hope. So for those of you that have not been with us recently, um, there may be some of you, we have been studying uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And uh, this is found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And basically what this is, is this is a sermon that's an explanation of what is called the new commandment that Jesus gave his disciples, found in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. It's not really a new commandment, but it's a expounding of understanding on this, and it made it new in that sense. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. How? As I have loved you, you you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, this commandment was so different from what Judaism had taught and what paganism practiced that when Jesus' sermon was over, the disciples were totally amazed at his teaching. In fact, It was stated by some that no one had ever spoke like this man before. In his sermon, Jesus describes what true Christianity looks like. His followers are to be different than the nominal church and the secular world that we're surrounded by. They are to be what I like to call cross-cultural. Cross-cultural. Their morals are to go far beyond just do's and don'ts. They're to be a lifestyle where love rules the heart. Love rules the heart. Now let me warn you right now, this lifestyle is one that can't be produced by trying. It can only be lived out by those who have experienced what Scripture calls the new birth experience, being born again. Those who have been born again and have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. So with that in mind, I want to just invite you to bow your heads with me for an added word of prayer this morning. Father, I believe that more than ever, this message that you've given to me today to share with this church family And with those that are listening abroad is a life-changing message. It's one that helps us firmly have our feet rooted and planted on the rock, Jesus Christ. And with that firm foundation comes a confidence, it comes a peace, there comes a joy that we can carry through us through life, no matter what our circumstances. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that again, you would once again help us to open our hearts and our minds and give us understanding, not just intellectually, but in our spirit. I pray for heavenly angels, Father, to once again hold back the winds of strife, the forces of darkness that wants to bring confusion and distraction in our midst. Help us to be solely focused right now on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Help me, Father to do my best to present your word again that lives are changed are solidified in a loved relationship with you in Jesus name I pray this prayer amen 
Right now, I want you to help me. Please bear with me for a moment, and I want you to help me out with an exercise before we continue. I want you to get together with at least one other person for a moment. Uh, if it, it can be more than one, just don't get the group too large. And this isn't going to take us very long at all, because just in a moment, I am going to say a word, all right, out loud, and I want you to immediately think of the word that first comes to mind and share it with the people that you're with. No fair changing. If you come to the same word that someone else does, that's fine, right? I just want you to think of what the first word that comes to your mind when I say this particular word and share it with one another. Here's the word. Persecution. Okay. Share it with somebody real quick because we're about ready to move on. All right, I don't have a microphone that I'm going to take around to the congregation. What we're going to do right now is you're just going to have to use your good old lungs, fill that diaphragm, push the air out, and I want to hear some responses. What was the first word that came to your mind when I said the word persecution? Death. Death. Trials. Hardships. Persecution coming. Pain. What was that one? Ancient. End times. End times. Thank you. All right. Don't have my hearing aids in. You know, it's interesting. Not one person did I hear say blessed or happy. It just didn't roll off of your tongue, did it? I mean, I, I, that's not a, a, a word that would just naturally roll off my tongue. Oh, blessedness. Oh, happiness. That's not a word we would naturally use when we hear that word persecution. Yet Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted. In other words, happy. Happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Now, I don't imagine that any of the disciples thought those two words would be related together. Happiness, persecution. Just like many of us, none of us put that together. Do you remember what Jesus said before this? He said, blessed are the peacemakers. For they will be called children of God. God's children are called to be peacemakers. They're not begging for a fight. They're ambassadors of peace, ministers of reconciliations, as we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Yet Jesus says in Matthew 5 and verse 10, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for what purpose? Because of righteousness. It's one thing to be persecuted for doing something wrong. It's another thing to be persecuted because of righteousness. Or we might say right living, right doing. Why should I be persecuted for doing something right? Well, I want to share with you a couple of reasons here this morning. First of all, because the righteousness that Jesus is talking about here, the righteousness that his children display is not their own righteousness. It's not the righteousness of humanity. It's the righteousness of whom? The righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. Matthew 5.11 says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of, because of me, because of Christ's righteousness. It is the righteousness of Christ that is imparted that we are being persecuted for as Christians. 
The love that Romans 5 says that God, through the Holy Spirit, is pouring out into our hearts continually. Why? Why persecution? Because the moment that you become a born-again Christian and you begin to reflect the character of your Father, which is in heaven, you enter into what's called the great controversy, great controversy, the great battle between Christ and Satan. Once you become a Christian, you have become now a citizen of a new place. You're no longer a citizen of this world, but you're a citizen of where? Heaven. And where are you living? In enemy territory. Satan, who is the prince of this world, looks at you as a traitor. He looks at you as an enemy. And since the whole world is under his control, his influence, as it says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, he will use the world to persecute you. Not for being bad, but for being good. This shouldn't come to surprise to us as Christians. Why not? Well, let's look. John 15 Beginning with verse 18, Jesus says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it what? It hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you what? Out of the world. That is why the world hates you. A Christian, in other words, is an extension of Christ. He has put on, or she has put on, Christ. We resemble, as a Christian, our Father, which is in heaven. And Satan hates you for that. And the world looks at you as a traitor. You used to belong to it. Now you've changed sides. And that's why you'll be hated. Going on, Jesus says, Remember the words that I spoke to you? No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will do what? Why should we be surprised? Jesus tells us right in this word, If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. At the same time, if they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. In other words, they'll either follow you because of Jesus or they'll persecute you because of Jesus. They will treat you this way because of my name, Jesus says, for they do not know the one who sent me. They don't know the one who sent me. This one that they don't know who sent Jesus may be of a deliberate, I don't know him and I don't want to know him. The Jews knew that Jesus was like no other man. They saw the works that he did. No other man had ever done. And I'm not just talking about the miracles. I'm talking about the compassion, the love that he displayed. No one ever showed such things. They even heard him say, His time had now come. The one that they were looking for, they knew, some of them, who he was, and yet they rejected him. Therefore, those who reject Jesus will despise you. Jesus goes on. He says, if I had come, 
and sp- if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of what? God doesn't hold us accountable for something we don't know. If I, if I had not come and if I had not spoken to them, they wouldn't be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no what? They have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without what? They hated Christ, not for any evil or anything that he had done, not for any unkindness, but simply because of his righteous works, which he did, that they could not duplicate. If the world can imitate a Christian, no problem. There's no problem there. But if as Christians we're doing something, we're displaying something that they can't display, that they can't replicate, then what follows is jealousy and anger. Loving your enemies. Who does that? Praying for those who persecute you. This isn't the something that the world does. This is something from above. The moment you accept Christ, you become a citizen of heaven. That means as a believer, you're now living, as I mentioned, in enemy territory. And you've become involved in the battle, the great controversy. The second reason that Satan will persecute you for is because He's a poor loser. I can tell you on game night, if you take me down, you're not going to win. I don't care who anybody else in that group can win, but if you're the one who's guilty of taking me down, you're going down. You're going down. I'm going to sabotage you. If I'm not going to win, you're not going to win. Somebody's going to win, but it's not going to be you if it's up to me. Satan is furious that you've changed your allegiance. He's furious that you've become a citizen of heaven. Therefore, he's going to begin to bring suffering upon you so that you lose hope. And in losing hope, You lose faith in Jesus Christ. Read the story of Job in the Old Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Will be persecuted. They will be persecuted. Satan has not changed his ways. He will persecute you just like he persecuted the prophets of old. He wants you to believe that God is a vengeful God. That he's just waiting to bring down his wrath upon you and upon others. That God is the one responsible for the suffering of humanity. When in reality... Who is Satan? He's the one who's bringing the suffering. Have you ever heard someone say, boy, you know, if God is so powerful, if God it was, was so loving, why isn't he doing something? Why is he allowing this happen to me, to happen to me? You ever heard the parable of the weeds? Matthew 13, and verse, beginning with verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, what happened? 
his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds, what happened? They also appeared. Hmm. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seeds in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? An enemy done this, he replied. The servants asked him, Oh, So do you want us to go and pull them up, pull the weeds up? Jesus says, no, he answered. Because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may what? You may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the, when? Until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles and to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring them where? Into my barn. See, when it's full time for harvest, you can see clearly what's what. And it's because it's the time of harvest, you can uproot it. It's harvest time, right? It's harvest time. God is allowing sin to run its course so that no one will ever go there again. But he isn't idly just sitting by and watching from afar distantly, allowing it to just run its course. He sent Jesus into the world to save us through him, not to bring condemnation. Some people say, where was God in 9-11? Where was God at that moment? He was the one running into that burning building to pull people out. He was the one tending the wounds of the burned, the battered, the broken, and the bruised. He was the one consoling the brokenhearted, who had lost loved ones in that tragedy. He was there. But he wasn't there just on 9-11. But he's there for eternity. For all those who have need. He's still comforting the wounded. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. His name is Yeshua, Jesus, the one who fights for us and is our Savior. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us. Jesus became sin for us. Why? So that in him, in other words, in his death and in his resurrection, he might become, we, that we might become the righteous of God. Because in Christ we have died and in Christ we have been raised again. This is the good news that Satan does not want us to understand. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11, Jesus mentions three ways, at least here, that in, in this passage, in ways that Satan will attack you. Blessed are you when people insult you. Blessed are you when people persecute you. Blessed are you when people falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me insults persecution bearing false witness does this sound familiar did they insult jesus did they persecute him did anyone bear false witness about his works 
If this is true of our Savior, and His Spirit abides in us as believers, why would we think that we would be treated any differently by the world? I want you to think about this for a moment. What did Jesus see first when he came to this world? Suffering or glory? Suffering. There was suffering first, and then there was glory. Why would we expect something different? And how should Christians then react to this type of treatment? Jesus goes on in verse 12. He says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way that they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Hmm. How did Jesus react when they insulted him, persecuted him, bared false witness against him? Luke 23, 34 says, He cried out, Father, forgive them, for they really don't know what they are doing. Hmm. Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with what? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Do you see a description of Jesus here? Yeah. As dearly loved children of God, he says, clothe yourself with Jesus. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. We heard a lot of that last week about that. He says, forgive as the Lord Forgave you. How did Christ forgive us? Unconditionally. Unconditionally. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is is the very foundation. It's it's the encompassing part of all those virtues. And let the peace of Christ, the peace of whom? Christ. Christ. We heard a lot about the peace of God, right, last week? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. If this is whom we claim to be, then the peace of Christ will rule in our hearts no matter the circumstances, no matter our situation. Oh, we may not like it. We may feel even some discomfort at the moment, but we can be of good cheer for Christ has overcome the world. Since as members of one body you were called to peace, and Paul says, be thankful. Remember our children's story this morning? On one side, the little boy, he just sees this mess. That's all he sees, this mess. Saw his mother diligently working. And yet, things were messy. But once he saw the other point of view, when he was sitting on his mother's lap, Oh, there was that beautiful picture. Right now, right now, life is messy for most of us. It's a mess. But God, does he have a plan? Does he have a pattern that he's following? Mm Mm-hmm. One day, when we're on the other side, we're going to see the glory. Right now, we need to trust by faith that he knows what he's doing. A couple more verses to share with you, or passages. Romans 8, 
beginning with verse 28. And we know, that's the question I want you to, I want to ask you, do you know? Do you know this? Can you say this with the Apostle Paul? And we know that in how many things? All things. How many things? All things. How many things? All things. Let's tell Satan that this morning. We know. No matter what you can do, Satan. We know the things that you purpose for destruction. We know your conniving lives and your works and your desire to pull us, pull, take our faith from us and steal the salvation that we have in Christ. We know. And we know that in all these things, God can work. And he can do it for good for those who love him. Who've been called according to his purpose. How many has God called? All of us, the world. But not all will respond, not all will believe. They believed a lie from the enemy instead of the truth from their creator's lips. 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. He might be the firstborn of many. See, Christ, we're following in his footsteps. Remember, suffering came first. But then there was glory. Christ himself lived by faith in his Father in heaven. Just as we are to live by faith in our Father in heaven. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he's also justified. In other words, just as I never sinned. God has justified us. And those he justified, he will also do what? Glorify. What then, Paul says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. He goes on and he says, God, the one who didn't spare his own son for us, gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us how much? All things. Even the strength to endure persecution? Even the courage to get up out of bed in the morning when we don't feel like it? Even the courage to do something nice to someone who has been making our lives miserable? Verse 33 says, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? Who can condemn us? No one. If God justifies us, no one can condemn us. Christ Jesus, the one who died more than that, who was raised to life, he himself is even at the right hand of the Father. What is he doing? Interceding for us. When you feel alone, when you feel discouraged, when you feel battered, when you feel bruised, when you feel taken advantage of, when it's happening to you, when the enemy is throwing everything at you, Jesus is there interceding for you. Can anybody separate us from the love of Christ? No. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword separate us from the love of Christ? No. As it is written, for your sakes, we face death how long? How often? All day long. 
We are considered as sheep to be what? Who was the true lamb? Jesus. What happened to him? He was slaughtered. Why should we expect anything different? Paul goes on, he says, no. And all these things, Satan, you may think you're the victor, but we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation are going to be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Another passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 7, Paul says, but we have this treasure. You know what treasure he's talking about? The treasure of Christ. We have this treasure. We have Christ in jars of what? How brittle is clay? Who do you think these uh, jars of clay are? We are. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from who? From us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed but not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We may be struck down, but we're not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. You see, we may be knocked down, but we get up. The world stands over us and says, why don't you stay down? Why don't you stay down? Say, I can't. Because the one who lives now lives in me. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life, his life, may be revealed in our mortal bodies. Closing, I want to take you to Revelation. And I didn't put all these texts up, and I'm not going to read all these passages. I just want you to turn there to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to read some of those verses. Revelation 6, beginning with verse 12. We're at the opening of the sixth seal. Verse 12. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth, and the late figs dropped from the fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded back like a scroll rolling, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. What's the prophet seeing? What's he describing here? The coming. The coming of the, the king. The coming of Jesus. He says at that moment in verse 15, he says, the kings of the earth, the princes and the generals and rich and mighty, all of them, slave and free, every one of them, what do they start doing? They're looking for places to? Isn't it interesting, the ones who were the persecutors are the ones now feeling as if they're going to be persecuted and they're running for cover. They cry out on the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. We get into chapter 7. says to saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the winds he says hold on a little bit longer until my people are sealed verse 9 after this 
After the ceiling, I looked up, and there before me was a great multitude which no one could count. From every nation, tribe, and people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb, and they were wearing what? White robes. And were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. The angels that were standing around the throne, they just, they just, with the elders and, they, and the living creatures, they all fall down their faces before the throne and they worship God and they begin to sing out. Verse 13 says, then one of the elders asked me then, he says, who, who are these in the, in the white robes? Who are they? And, and where did they come from? And the prophet John says, well, I don't know. You know, don't you? Tell me, in other words, that's what he's saying. I don't know, who are, who are they? And he said, these are the ones who have come out of the great what? Tribulation, persecution. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And therefore, they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God himself will do what? Wipe away every tear. Friends, I want to be honest with you this morning, just like Jesus was honest. In this world, as a believer, you can believe you're going to be persecuted. You are going to go through difficult times. And if you live long enough, you're going to go through a time of trouble that no one has ever heard or seen before. But God's people will be happy. They consider themselves blessed because they are suffering for Christ. They're suffering for righteousness. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs may be the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's why I want you to pick up the first copy of the Truth Link series when you leave today. If you already have the series, leave that one there for someone else. If we have extras, you can pick it up next week. Or if you have a loved one that's not here today, by all means, pick it up for them. And go on a journey. We're going to come up to another quarter. I'm going to introduce something else. But for this first quarter, truth link. Take the first guide. There's 27 lessons in this series, so that means you're going to have to do more than one a week because a quarter is only 13 weeks, and we're already a weekend. But I hope that when you pick up the first one and you go through it, you won't be able to put it down. I want you, each one of you here, And those online, I want you rooted and grounded in the love of Christ so that the enemy cannot shake you. I want you to know the joy, even in suffering. Now, there's a big card in that series, or in that first lesson, shows how you can you can do these lessons online. So if you like doing computers or you need larger print it, it's a great way to do it. 
It'll tell you how to do that. And for those that are online, it's truthlink.org. Truthlink.org. If you want to order a set of studies, you can do that. You can go online. I've given you the link. You can go online, order a printed copy, have it sent to your house, pay for shipping and handling. There you go. If you wanted to go through, don't want to go through all that mess, then I'll make it even more simple. Put your name, your phone number, the number of sets that you want. Get a tithe envelope. I've given, told you how much it's going to cost. I'm going to pay for the shipping, or the church will pay for the shipping. You just put in a tithe envelope, that amount, for the number of sets that you want. We'll order them and get them here as quickly as possible. But friends, I hope that you'll take me up on that invitation. Because I don't want to see you suffering without having hope and joy. Because believe me, in this world, in all honesty, you can either suffer with Christ or you can suffer without him. I don't know about you, but joy comes in the morning. Please stand and let's sing the first two verses of How Firm a Foundation. Always being there for us, for never leaving nor forsaking us. Thank you for your presence that abides with us. May we abide with you this week and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.